Welcome everybody online. You know, it happens, you know, kind of like they all start going out of flickering and all kinds of stuff. So, okay. Let's open up prayer. Father God, we do ask you a blessing on this teaching tonight. I thank you, Lord, that we are your glorious church. I thank you for causing us to see more and more this revelation of who we are in you and, and more of you, your plans and your purposes and, and what we can walk in according to your spirit, your spirit of love and truth. So we give you praise, glory, and honor. And Lord, I just pray that we have ears to hear what your spirit saying. And that Lord, you call us to be able to uh, uh, just in, in the show, project the light of Jesus to this world and to each other. Uh, and, and so thank you, Father, for uh, causing to speak as an oracle of God as well. In Jesus' name we thank you. Amen. So we're in the middle of uh, talking about the glorious church that's emerging on the face of the earth today. You know? Uh, and we are working on finally tuning uh, the, ourselves to do our part in the, as a member of the glorious church that is anointed today. And then you are anointed. Did you know you're anointed? I feel like. Amen. I feel nice. You, you, everybody say, I'm anointed. Amen. That's right. And your light never has to go out. Amen. And, um, and I also know God well enough to say uh, that all of us have access to the equipment and the power of God needed for living a Christ-like life anywhere on the face of the earth at this time. Uh, you lack nothing in the world. You really do not lack anything in the world. Those who follow the Old Testament in the Old Covenant, they lack nothing either. Uh, God took care of them, even though they weren't even saved. God took care of them. The only thing that we may lack are the knowledge and wisdom needed for walking, the knowledge and the wisdom needed for walking with God in these things, and whatever thing you might be needing to walk wisdom in and knowledge in. But that only comes down from the Father of lights. That's cute. Right? Come on. And, and the Holy Spirit inside us and his Bible. However, we do not lack. We may lack wisdom and knowledge, but we do not lack position and power of authority. You don't lack the power. You got that money name of Jesus. You got the blood of Jesus. You're seated at God the Father's right hand. You don't lack authority. You don't lack power. You may lack wisdom. You may lack knowledge. But you don't lack the power and authority to operate and do what God gave you when you were first born again. And then increase, I know it increases when you talk about uh, getting filled with the Holy Ghost. So I want to share about the Glorious Church, seeing the love and the anointing needed for our families and workplaces. Because you understand the Glorious Church is everyday life. And his spirit working in everyday life. Well, I don't know this. You all hear that? Okay, I'm hoping that I can, you know, deter that a little bit. It's crackling. And, and all we need is to see these things and start walking in it. And once you see it you can, and hear it, you can use your faith to walk in it. Yeah, you know, you, you, all you got to do is see it and hear it. And you can walk in it with power. When faith comes, of course, by hearing and hearing possibly the Word of God. And on whatever subject you, you, you're studying, whatever subject you need to study, so let's begin with our families first tonight. In the Glorious Church, because the Glorious Church sees the kind of love needed for their families. Uh, Ephesians chapter 6, if you would. First verse. And I'm going to read this again out of the Passion Translation. First verse. Children, 
Remember last week we talked about the love between a husband and wife. That's an extremely important love. It's the closest, most intimate relationship that we can experience or have an example of how to walk with God, the Father, um, and Jesus, our Savior. But the next, I think the next most important relationship is the one between parents and children. And so the first verse says, children, if you want to be wise, listen to your parents and do what they tell you, and the Lord, or through the Lord, he will help you. So right now, this is what we do as parents. Now, you know, like, like Ms. Sheila said about a year ago, <laughs> you know, I remember this from a year ago. She said, now, now that we've learned about where we missed it in raising our children, <laughs> you know, what do we do about now that they're adults? Why do we still love them? That's what she did, right? <laughs> Amen. And, uh, and, 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 Kids would be wise to listen to their parents, even though they're adults. Of course, they got to hear the Holy Spirit for themselves, for, for the things they need to choose to do in life. Uh, and, and that's what we, we endeavor to teach them. And, and they still need to obey the parents. And, some, and if they're young and they're still under the guardianship of the parent or under a guardian, they also, uh, they also need to realize, children also need to realize, and you as a parent should take, always consider this when you're disciplining or working with your children, or working with young children that are under your authority. Uh, you, you're not the only one trying to parent this child. you got the Father trying to parent this child, too. You have the Holy Spirit, because you're saved, you see. Every one of y'all here born again, I know this. And I didn't, and he was every one of you speaking on this. I know this, right? So, every one of you can do this. Because the Spirit of God is on the inside of you. And because of that relationship with the Lord, guess who else is trying to parent and raise your children? Amen? You're not doing it alone. And the kids, they need to realize they're not, they're not growing alone either. Not only do they have you as parents, but they have the Father. He loves them so much, and so they're supposed to learn from this parent-child relationship, the kind of parent-child relationship they're supposed to have with the Lord, as an example. Now, as a parent, parents, we are unwitted to be parents. And even though they grow up, we still have influence. We will always have influence for your kids. Okay? They're, all, they're your kids, and, and uh, you'll have influence. Uh, And, and you're going to learn how to continue to have this right relationship that it's in a position where children uh, are going to be encouraged to want to be wise, want to listen to you, uh, want to be taking your input. You have as a parent uh, um, a way of presenting truths to them that can help them and cause them to come back wanting more. And, and that's one of the things I, you know, I want to be as a, as a father. I want, I want my kids to be able to we give them enough information, that good information, that'll help them make one come back from more. Because that's the relationship. Now, and you can learn how to be a parent from the almighty parent, Father God. So neither of children or parents are alone in doing this process that we hear or read Paul uh, wrote in this letter about the glorious church. We're not doing this alone. It's very important. And I, and I have to remember that also like when I'm witnessing or sharing Jesus with somebody. You, you know, Jesus is trying to get them saved more than you. <laughs> so there's nobody there to help you, okay? The Holy Spirit, that is. The Father, Son, Holy Spirit. God anoints the family. That, that is taught in his word. God anoints the family the way he taught, showed us the word of truth that's in his word. Uh, the word doesn't seem, in nowadays estimation, it seems that the people don't seem to value parents as much as they used to. That, and by that I mean dad and mom. You can see right there what I'm saying that, that there, there are areas in this world where you find, I mean, look at all the stuff that's going down with the teachers and the Board of Education and all this, right? 
I mean, you, you know, they don't value people don't value the nuclear family like they should. Not like the way God taught us in the Word to value family. Now, I know that every situation isn't perfect, and you got to work with what you can, and that's okay. But you know. You don't take away, just because my parents were divorced and all that, doesn't mean I don't want to have a successful marriage. You know what I'm saying? It doesn't, you know, it doesn't calculate that way. Because God wants that marriage. God wants that relationship uh, between you and, as a parent and your children. He wants that relationship to be strong, to be healthy, to be spiritual. Not just natural. You know, a lot of parents do a lot of natural things, and there are a lot of natural things that must be done. But you've got to include the spiritual aspect in your relationship. I don't care if the kids don't want to hear it. You need to introduce it to them. Again, oh, and you, you may have to be called witty, but the Holy Spirit knows how to give you know how to give you. But you need to keep inserting the spiritual truth to your children, no matter what age they are, because it is the truth. And if you've made a mistake, or if you've done something wrong, well, then ask for forgiveness, for goodness sake. <laughs> Bring healing right to that relationship immediately, as soon as you can, do it. Uh, and, and, and don't, you know, and you don't have to prove, well, you're just as bad as I am. You, you don't need to do that either. <laughs> you ever notice sometimes when they're apologizing, that's it. Well, you know, you had your part to do something, right? Anybody been there? <laughs> that's not the way it's true. That's not the, that's not the nature or the wisdom of God. Amen. Just cut out. Mm -hmm. Oh, batteries today. Having issues with batteries tonight. Okay. Uh, I just been. <laughs> Um, I see that she was different right now. So I will put that there and while I'm doing that, let's bar go as much. Uh, you pop on Joe's mic real quick for a little bit? Sure. Oh, sure. Yep. Okay. So as parents that we need to do this, we need to understand and as children, you need to obey your parents as God anointed it. Um, and it seems that a lot of people today want other authorities to watch over your kids. Have you, have you noticed that some people want to try to take over watching over your kids? And, uh, that's out of order, and it's very sad that parents are not respected the way they need to be respected in today's society. Now, let me just say this. Kids are not an inconvenience either. Kids are not an inconvenience. Uh, they're a blessing. You know, the world has no real hope outside the love of God. They don't they don't know God. They have no real hope. They have no real hope. So let's read a familiar psalm, Psalm 127. And I'm going to use the Passion again, the Passion Translation on this. Now this happens to be, it's titled in the Passion uh, as God and His Gifts. And it's a song of, of the stairway or song of ascent. Um, the songs of ascent are from Psalm 120 to 134, and this is Psalm 127. And this was written by King Solomon. So first verse. If God's grace doesn't help the builders, they will labor in vain to build a house. So the world has no hope without God. If God's mercy doesn't protect the city, all the centuries will circle it in vain. It really is senseless to work so hard from early morning to late at night, toiling to make a living for fear of not having enough. God can provide for his devoted lovers even while they sleep. What an encouraging song. Verse 3. So, in other words... God take care of you. He'll protect you. And in fact, your house is not going to really be protected by all your natural things if God isn't part of it. Okay? You, you want to see your house protected? 
God has to be part of it. Verse 3, children are God's love gift. They are heaven's generous reward. Have you ever told your kid, you're my reward? Well, you know, you got scripture to say that. You're my reward. <laughs> you're a reward to me. Children born to a young couple will one day rise to protect and provide for their parents. <laughs> Happy will be the couple who has many of them. A household full of children will not bring shame on your name, but victory when you face when you face your enemies. For your offspring will have influence and honor to prevail on your behalf. Amen. That's that's for kids, folks. And see, family is a God thing meant for growth and blessing. You know, we really have got to see this and appreciate our family more on that. And, and, and this is all from just the very first verse in that chapter in Ephesians 6. Now we're on verse 2. For the commandment, honor your father and your mother, was the first of the Ten Commandments, which with a promise attached, you will prosper, or you can say, it will go beautifully for you. You will prosper or it will go beautifully for you and live a long, full life if you honor your parents. Okay? This is important. And Paul rightly points this out in this letter here, this particular command. It comes with its own rewards and promises. You know? Uh, just like there isn't any perfect parents, there, of course, isn't any perfect children. But our goal and in our, in our, in, in our estimation has to be to try to be a blessing to our parents. And see, and especially as you get older, I mean, I want to bless my older parent than, than, than before. You know what I mean? I want to take care of them. I want to love them. Verse 4. Fathers, don't exasper at, um, exasperate your children. Now, in other words, that, that means as fathers should show consideration for the different levels of understanding and experience that each child possesses and deal with them, dealing with them on at their level or, or risk causing them loads of heartache. In other words, you can't overburden your children when you're raising them. Uh, you have to have wisdom in, in, in what you do. But you, that you, you, you do influence them. You do raise them up. Because it goes on, it says, fathers don't exasperate your children, but raise them up with loving discipline and counsel that brings their re the revelation of our Lord. So, you know, what I see a lot of parents do is they deal with their kids because if their kids are acting up in public, they're more embarrassed about the way their kids act than they are about what's causing or influencing the kid to act that way. And parents, I mean, I agree. It's not good that they act that way. It can be embarrassing. But don't let your mind go there. Resist that. What's causing the problem? What's, what is really being the problem? Maybe the problem is if you spoil them. But, you know, come to grips with such things. It's okay, you know. Look, I was spoiled. I, I was. As far as, I mean, my mom did, but she did a lot. I had... I had a lot more toys than anyone else in the neighborhood. You know, they came to my house to play. That's where they played. They came. I had them all, and then some. Okay, why? Because I was an only child, so my mom only had to care for me, and so she could spend lots of money on my Star Wars action figures, my Battlestar Galactic action figures, my GI Joe action figures, my uh, Masters of the Universe action figures, my Oh, boy. My Black Hole. Have you ever seen the movie Black Hole? I had those action figures. Star Trek. Star Trek's the movie. I had those action figures. I had action figures all over. <laughs> and the sets to go with it. And the ships. And, I mean, I, and, and the accessories. You know, the extra guns. The extra backpacks. I, that's what I had. And I played all day underneath my carport, and my friends would come over and play with me. I had also matchbox cars, Hot Wheel cars, cars that you, I don't even know the company that made them. 
but I have them. <laughs> you know? But we can't, we have to remember that when we discipline our child, we have to do it in a way that's going to cause them to think about God rather than, you know, not hurting your pride. Okay? Uh, you know, I, and I've seen such cruelty done to kids because their parent was so embarrassed. And that's sad. I mean, I know, the kids shouldn't be acting up, but neither should you. <laughs> that's just the truth. Um, but the glorious church, they're going to have insight. And I believe if you'll press in, if you're really serious about this, and if you, you know, if you have grandkids too, if you have grandkids too, come on now, amen. They, they, your, your your children are going to need guidance in raising the grandkids, right? Uh, you know, the biggest problem with most of the craziness that we see in society today is directly related to the breaking down of the God-designed nuclear family. That's where the most problem is. God started out with the nuclear family. And that's what the devil has attacked. He, he'll, he'll start with, he'll, he'll go after the husband and wife. If he can't get it there, he'll go after the kids. And, and if he can't get it there, he'll go after the dog. He'll go after it all. Until he gets some kind of way, in, he's trying to weasel his way into your family. That's what he's trying to do. Don't let him. Don't let him. The glorious church, which you are part of, will get the anointing from God to have the wisdom that you need to overcome. And you'll have the wisdom in raising it so that when you do discipline them, it's going to be in a way that will help in the end draw them closer to God. And that is what we want to do. We want to influence in such ways. Um, that's the biggest problem I see today, is, is, is the attack against the nuclear family. Wrong concepts that fight against the finality of this truth about the family unit, father, mother, children, biological and spiritual relationships. It, it, all that is is man trying to redefine family into his own fallen identity. Any other, relation, any other family related situation that you're a part of, I mean, now if you're a child, you know, that's, you know that's just, you're limited. But if you're a, an adult and you're the, supposed to be the head of your family, any of those other kinds, you're just identifying with a fallen identity in Christ. That's not in God. That's not Christ. That's worldly. And nothing short of worldly wisdom. All this stuff we hear is nothing short of worldly wisdom, and it doesn't come down from the Father of light. Let's go to James 1. You see, God warns James. He warns us about this stuff. He speaks to this. He says in verse 16, James 1, 16, Do not be deceived. That means you can be deceived. Okay, when the Bible says do not be deceived, that means in this area there has already been launched attack against the church or they would, the pastors, these leaders, these ministers would not be saying don't be deceived. Okay, well that hasn't changed any. You understand people are the same way. So keep that in mind. Do not be deceived, my beloved brethren. Every good gift and every perfect gift is from above, comes down from the Father of lights, with whom there is no variation or shadow of turning. In other words, there's no shade in, 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 in the Lord that way. He's going to shine all the way through. Of his own will, he brought us forth by the word of truth, that we might be a kind of first fruits of his creatures. And that's talking about your being born again. He's brought us to a place so that all men can be saved. That's what he's bringing us to. Now let's go to chapter 3, 13th verse. Okay? The world is raging against the wisdom of God, folks. We're in a fallen world, and we're in a time where people aren't even respectful to the truth. There used to be a day when, you know, you know, people would respect, but now they don't even do that. Verse 13. Who is wise and understanding among you? Let him show by good conduct that his works are done in the meekness of wisdom. But if you have bitter envy and self-seeking in your hearts, do not boast and lie against the truth. Okay, so if something's going on, don't go saying the Bible doesn't work. 
Or the Bible doesn't mean what it, mean, it says it means. It, it means exactly what it says. This wisdom does not descend from above, but is earthly, sensual, and demonic. For where envy and self-seeking exist, right there is the problem. All about yourself. It's going to affect the way you interact with your kids, interact with people. Okay, it says, uh, For where envy and self-seeking exist, confusion and every evil thing are there. But the wisdom that, uh, that is from above is first pure, then peaceable, gentle, willing to yield, willing to yield, Okay, you're not always right. You've got to yield to some things. Sometimes, you, you, you know, you make the wrong choice. Be willing to change and yield to the wisdom of God. Full mercy and good fruits without partiality. You see, God has no partial favorites, okay? He doesn't, favor, he doesn't even favor Jesus more than he favors you. Did you all hear that? He does not favor Jesus more than he favors you. In fact, he sees you seated with Jesus in heavenly places. So he does not favor you above Jesus. We are the ones responsible for deferring to him. But God sees us as people, equal. Okay? Without partiality. Now the fruit of righteousness is sown. That means you have to offer it. In other words, if you're not putting out fruits of righteousness... You're not going to reach a harvest of righteousness. You have to. You cannot be a closet Christian here. You have to come out and serve the Lord in His right words, in His right way, in His righteousness, in your in your stance that is with the Lord. You got to act like the person who's sitting sitting with Jesus at God the Father's right hand. That's the person you are. You walk in that. You need to live in that knowledge. Okay, that's what he's talking about. Fruits of righteousness is sown in peace by those who make peace. That's your goal. You need to make peace. As much as it depends on you, Romans says. As much as it depends on you. Be at peace with all men. And that goes with your family. This is the glorious church. It's all about living in the light and sharing the light with each other and the world. Now, the glorious church sees these simple truths from the Bible and it's Holy Spirit. The glorious church sees these principal truths uh, from the Bible and its Holy Spirit that inspired the Bible. And the glorious church, continuing on in uh, Ephesians chapter 6, 5th verse. Uh, the glorious church sees the kind of love needed in our workplace. You, do you know you need to walk in love at work? I mean, I don't know, I mean, you, uh, when you're out in public, you need to walk in love, and when you're in private, you need to walk in love. When you're at work, you need to walk in the love of God. Why? Because he has the glorious church. Your job is to shine. Your job is to be a light. Your job is to show the love of God. Just like you need to do it at home, you do it at church, you do it at, at, when you go shopping, uh, you know, and then you do it at work or whenever you're doing any other kind of work. You want to let the light of God, the love of God, shine out so it's a light. And if you're the owner of a business or if you're in management, then you need to put your faith out for God helping you influence everybody under your authority the best way possible since uh, you have certain authorities in running the place. You, you, you have authority. And, and you, you need the wisdom of God in that. In Ephesians chapter 5, again, in the Passion Translation, it says, those who are employed should listen to their employers. Okay? Or if, you liter if the literal translation is, um, servants should obey their caretakers. And obey their instructions with great respect and honor. In other words, with trembling. Trembling. You think, why am I supposed to be true? Yes, if they're an authority over you or you're an authority over them, realize the weight of your authority and realize the weight of those who are upper management or even owner above you, the authority that they have. Realize it, and, and there's a certain ounce of trembling that needs to be there. 
Serve them with humility. Uh-oh, that's the thing right there. Serve, serve them with humility in your hearts as though you were working for the Master or the Messiah. You're working for the Lord. That, you're not just working for your boss. Right? Some people say, well, I don't want to work for the man, whatever that man is. I don't know what that means, but it means through the system of, of, of economic system. I don't, you know, uh, you, you, you're working for the Lord. Everybody say, I'm working for the Lord. Who has a job? Okay. You're working for the Lord. I don't care who's in charge. I don't care who's in management, including yourself. If you're in management, guess what? You're still working for the Lord. And that needs to reflect in your work ethic. And in the way you treat one another. You've got to be, when everyone else is angry, tired, whatever, complaining, fussing, you don't join in. You bless and do not curse, whether you are the employee or the employer. You bless and do not curse. You know, I've been doing this too. You know, there are some people in, in, that I've come across in my life where they, you know, they've come out against me in ways, and I'm saying, Lord, bless them so much that they see your love and your goodness that they don't even need to go after anybody. They don't need to talk bad about anybody. They can be so content in the joy of the Lord, they don't let the things of this world upset them. And if I'm wrong in any way, then help me to walk right. Because I work for you. You see, I work for you. This, this is a, and, and James 4 explains the whole thing. And you can read that whole chapter. And it explains the whole reason why there's wars, there's fighting. It's all because of people's selfish pride. That's why. If you're sitting there complaining and fussing, you are in pride. Because who do you think you are that you should be complaining? Huh? Who do you think you are? That you should complain about the pastor. You should complain about the work. You should complain about the, the government. You complain about this. You complain about your kids not doing this. You complain about, you complain about the dog. Okay. Complain about the cat. Yeah, I'm guilty there too. <laughs> you complain about your neighbor. You see a pattern here? If everything's worth complaining, the problem isn't the people. It's you. And besides that, the Bible has strict warnings against people complaining. It is an affront to the Spirit of God. And the love of God. You, aren't you glad God isn't complaining about you to all the angels? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Bismarck did it again. <laughs> yeah. Look, can you believe he did that, Michael? Michael, can you believe Bismarck did that? Huh? You think God treats you like that? No. No, his love is too much bigger than that. His love is, he sees the bigger picture, doesn't he? Amen. Aren't you glad? I'm glad that's, you know what, you clean up great, folks, and you, you may not know it yet, but especially when you get to heaven, you're going to be a shining star. You're going to be awesome there, man. You're going to be, you're going to, you're going to be in your niche when you're in heaven. But you can be in that right now, because there's an anointing on your life right now. The glorious church, that's what you've got. You've got, you've got a well that is deep, and it never runs dry. You got that well. And it, you can always draw from the Lord. He is a living, a, a, a mighty moving river coming out of you. Amen. Amen. Verse 6. Always do what is right, and not only when others are watching, so that you may please Christ as his servant by doing his will. Why? Is a one, if you realize and take the attitude that I'm working for Messiah then I know he's always watching, even if my employer is not watching, even if my uh, you know, foreman's not watching, or the manager, or, or if I'm the manager, and no, none of the employees are watching. Okay? None of the people under my management, they're, they're not watching. They, they, it doesn't matter. The Holy Spirit never leaves you. He's right there all the time. You, you don't escape, escape the... 
look, if a sparrow can die and God know it, if, if you can lose a hair and then God can subtract that from your account, let me tell you, he's always watching. That's good, because then if he's always watching, that means he always has a, he always has a way of victory for you. No matter what, always has a way of victory for you. Have faith in God. Have the God kind of faith. Know that God. Know God this way. Always do what's right. What, what, verse 7? Serve or minister. Think of it in terms of ministering. Although I'm getting paid for this. I am. I'm getting paid for this. I'm still trying to minister to because that person is worth more than just the paycheck they're giving you. They even owe it to you. They're worth more than that. You need to see your boss is more than just a paycheck. I can't tell you how many times when people I've worked with, you know, coming up, especially in the industries that I've worked in, uh, you know, it, you know, it's like they they, sit, they they act like the boss is a wicked en en enemy of theirs, and they're always complaining about you know this thing. And, and yeah, it's not always perfect. I get it. And you know, if I sit and listen to the group. I join right in after a while because I've, I've let that junk sink in my head. I'm hearing it, and then I'm joining in on, yeah, you know what, you're right. So, so is a jerk. Right? It happens. But we've got to watch that because God's always watching, and that's who's employing us, really. You see, that love is the requirement that he's lifting us up each and every day to live and walk. That's the standard. And if you're an employer, realize you're a caretaker of the flock. Let me go on and read. Uh, um, serve or minister your, your employers wholeheartedly and with love, as though you were serving Christ and not men. Be assured that any, you understand that's not talking about Jesus? It says serving Christ. Serving Christ, Christos. Serving the anointing of God. Now, I want you to think about that, because Jesus is a man, so this scripture is not talking about the man. It's talking about the anointing of God. You're serving the anointing of God. Your action can influence the anointing and its ability to flow in and through you. Your words can influence the ability of the anointing to work in you and through you. Real important. That you see this. Okay? You are wholeheartedly, you, your employers, serve your employers wholeheartedly with love as though you were serving the anointing and not men. In other words, your work ethics ought to uh, be a, a way in which the anointing can flow in your work. You're serving the anointing. Be assured that anything you do that is beautiful and excellent will be repaid by our Lord, whether you are an employee or an employer. You see that? See, the anointing is affected by your work ethic. Think about that. You want the anointing to be able to flow through you when someone says, I know you're a Christian and and uh, you know, my wife and I are having this. She found, and I had this one guy did this to me. And I was young. I was never married, and, and I didn't know much about relationships between husband and wife. I mean, I could help him out better now, but not then. I wasn't even, you know, I didn't even have a girlfriend. I don't believe at that time. He comes up to me and says, "My wife found out I was cheating." And she wants a divorce. You know, is there anything you, know? <laughs> you cheated, dude? What kind of, you did wrong. And of course, they end up divorcing and everything. It's sad. But the point is, you know, I, I, the only thing I could tell them is you gotta, you gotta, you know, you, you need to make yourself go to church. You, you're there, you live there in Annapolis, there's a church there, I'm sure. Go find a church, maybe the one that your mom went to. Go there and, and, you know, I mean, you gotta, you gotta start serving the Lord if you want to see this work. But see, you gotta work in a way that the anointing, see, the anointing can flow through you to help them. And, you know, of course, the one major message was always welcome forgiveness. Even though you're the one needing to be forgiven, ask for it, seek it, whatever it takes to try to restore the trust that needs to be restored. 
if you want to save that marriage. But he didn't take my advice, so, well, you know. Verse 9. And to the caretakers of the flock. Let me stop mid-sentence here. That is translated literally from the Aramaic. That's exactly how the Aramaic is translated. And to the caretakers of the flock. You see, caretakers of the flock, you, you know, that little translation uh, shows us the, uh, the level of care for servants as well as employees and employers. It should equal to the, the caring that a shepherd would his flock. It should equal the, the, the way a shepherd would his flock. It's equated with that kind of love, that kind of relationship, that kind of trust that needs to, you know, do, do, do you have your boss's confidence? Are you the boss? Do you have the confidence of some people in your church? In your, not your church, but in your, uh, in your, in your, the people who work under you? Do you have their confidence? This, this, this caring is equated to that of a shepherd caring for his sheep. Uh, the Greek text says, Masters, do the same things to them and give up threatening. I used to work, well, I had a couple of them, but, you know, that, 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 that boss, that manager that always was yelling at everybody at all the time, you want to have this job, you're going to, you know, and I mean, I mean, they yell when there is not anything wrong going on. They'll just yell because that's just the way they are. Um, you know, not you know when when there is a legitimate problem, uh, they're really down your throat. So, <laughs> yeah, but that's not that's the world, folks. That can't be us. That cannot be how our employees or uh, employer. We, you know, we can't treat the employer that way. Always fussing and complaining, yelling. Um, has anybody known anyone who does a lot of yelling at work? I know a few. So, and sometimes I can be the one yelling at work. It's not right. We we, we got to give up threatening. Uh, the Greek literal translation here speaks to me. As an employer, everyone who works for us at this church, because it speaks to me as important because they're actually family and friends. Uh, you know, there's no one is that is a family or friend that works here at this church and, and, and gets a paycheck. And, and, you know, because they're family and friends, I tend to sometimes, you know, don't always think in the professional way. I sometimes think in my natural way as a father in my house. You know, sometimes I'm good, sometimes I'm not. It's okay. I mean, it's not okay that I'm not good. Don't get me wrong. But my point is, there's a lot of learning and inspiration. And see, now I'm starting to see more of what it means to be an employer and how to care for the people. And not just be, and, and realize that, you know, we're a crew working here. We're doing a job here for the kingdom of God and for his people. So we got to keep this in the right way. The jobs, jobs are very important. And they are done by, here especially, by the people chosen by God to do that work. So I appreciate them, even though they are paid. And, you know, some people feel like if I pay them, I don't have to appreciate people. No, you do. You really need to appreciate people, even if you're paying them. And they all do it because of God's love, and we need to experience more of that love in our lives. Also, I appreciate the volunteers. Many of you are volunteers who freely give of your time and your talents to the ministry. You have to appreciate that. And you, you should know how important it is at least from my point of view, when I see that, I go, wow, this is great. These people are, they just, they just want to serve the Lord and please God. And I just want to thank you for that and appreciate Just know you're appreciated. Also, past volunteers. You know, just because someone, there was a falling out or whatever, and they, but they contributed and helped to this church, I'm going to be thankful for their lives because they were a blessing here. Even if they later didn't become one, uh, you know, they are a blessing. And we need to see that. And that's exactly what it means in the Lord's Prayer. I mean, um, the Psalm 23. It says, I'll lay 
may uh, you know God sets uh, spreads the table out before my enemies. Um, that's not going na 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 boo boo. God bless me and not you. That's not what that is. Although you've heard it that way, in fact I've said it that way in my times of preaching. But what that really means is you get those jerky people, you sit them down at a table, and it's kind of a spiritual thing, you sit them down at the table and you thank them for what they gave to you. What do you mean? If somebody's giving you a hard time, A, they may have done it because they loved you and they just didn't know how to relate very well. But the fact that they drew attention to it may have helped you later on. Also, just a simple fact, that when somebody abuses you, what's the Bible say to do? Bless and do not curse those who despitefully use you. That's what that means. When it says Sit, that God lays out a table before my enemies, all those troublemakers in my life, it's like, it's like that very hard teacher that you sit them down at the table and say, you were hard, but thank you, because it may have actually helped push you to strive for better, didn't it? See what I'm saying? So that's what that means. I lay a table. God lay. It's it's, it's God lays out a temple, a, a, a table of blessing, showing you that this person, even though they were hard, you know, you've learned something from it. So if you don't learn anything from an attack, then you're not following the Holy Spirit. Every attack needs to be understood in the light of the Spirit, and what truth you can get from it. Even if it's not how to protect you up in the future, that, thank God you, you you found a weak point where now they can't you can work on not get, you know not being so easily attacked that way. So there's always a reason to thank God for everybody, like the scripture says, thank God for everybody. So I appreciate the past volunteers. Uh, I also greatly appreciate the members of our church because you know you join this local body of believers. Your partner with the work of Christ here at Gatesburg, Maryland. Your partner here. Your partners. We're partners together. And last but certainly not least, all the people that regularly attend this church, and even the precious visitors that that you know join us for service. I thank God for all of you and all of them. Uh, you're welcomed and loved here. And it's our goal because. I gotta have. I'd like to have people to preach to. Okay, so if everybody's doing everything, and you're not just coming and listening and learning, and and then God's speaking to you to address things in your own life, uh, so that you can fulfill the call and will of God and purpose of God in your life, your gift. <clears throat> that's that is what uh, you know. It's good to have people here. Um, I'd rather have people here than not. So let me finish up. The last part of the verse says, "I say." Do what is right with your people by forgiving them when they offend you, for you know there is a master in heaven that shows no favoritism. God doesn't show any favoritism. Amen. So let's pray. Father God, we thank you for your presence. We thank you for your spirit here. Lord, I ask in Jesus' name that you reveal to each and every one of us, Lord, your will, your purpose, your plans. Thank you, Father, for your goodness. Thank you for your blessings on our lives. We give you glory, honor, and praise in all that you're doing in our lives and through our lives. We just thank you for that anointing. I thank you that we are the glorious church. And Lord, we're walking and doing the things that your glory, for your glory and because of your glory. In Jesus' name, amen. I don't... Okay, one thing I do know that I want to mention is that on the